a better understanding of the internet infrastructure, we can look at its core application, the World Wide Web. Let's go back to the concept of clients and server discussed in the introduction. For clients, a web browser, smartphone, copy machine to show a web page or an on-off switch or even a data visualization, it needs to reach out to a server. In response, the server send back the content of the web page, control a device triggered by the on-off switch or send the data needed for the data visualization. In all these cases, the client can use the HTTP protocol to send a request and receive a response from the server. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol and is the foundation of the web. Here is the anatomy of an HTTP request. You will recognize a key element of this HTTP request. It's URL for Uniform Resource Locator, the one that we type in the web browser to load a web page. It starts with the protocol here, HTTP, often with an S for secure when the connection is encrypted. Then we have the public domain name. This is the information that tells the network which server to target. And finally, we reach the root. This root is connected to a piece of code on the server in Python or a different language, which is triggered for every HTTP request. Each HTTP request has a specific method, also called a verb of the request, defining the action. The most common are these four, post, put, get, and delete. Taking the example of the light bulb described in the demo, with only one root, like slash lights, we could expose three different actions. With post, we can register a new light bulb on the server. With get, we could receive the list of all light bulbs available. With delete, we could delete all the light bulbs associated with the household. For such a lighting service, it is also convenient to perform action on the specific light bulb. Adding an identifier for each bulb, we would be able to access each light bulb to read its status with get, control it with put, or even remove it from the house with delete. Wait, wait. All these technical details, how is that relevant to my job as a designer of digital product, you might say, eh? Well, fair question. The root, also called pass, shapes what we call the web API of the product. API stands for Application Programming Interface. These are the resources or capabilities that the product exposes to the network. So what is the role of the designer regarding web APIs? To be in control of the design solution. Designers must have the ability to specify the requirement of a product, not only the hardware part, but also the software. Should the product expose services to the internet? In this case, what are the boundaries of this exposition? Who can access it? When, where, how, what resources, and to what extent? By specifying the API of your design solution, you control this exposition based on your understanding of the stakeholder needs and what they should be protected from. In the light bulb example, do we want to have the ability to change the color? Which stakeholder should have access to the whole list of devices? Can everyone control them remotely from outside the home network? These are examples of questions we want to be answered by designers rather than engineers lacking a holistic understanding of the context. With this understanding, you can address the two main challenges. First, it's granularity. Are resources on the server often requested individually or as a whole? For instance, does my application need to know the details of each occupant in the house 
or does it just need the total count? The second challenge is the structure. What is the most important way to access resources? In a connected house example, we could imagine accessing each device via their room or location. However, it might make more sense to have all devices in one single list. Beyond exposing services, the product might also require information from the internet. In this case, what requirements should it comply with? Thus, it is also important to be able to read the documentation of an API to understand the promises and limitations of service before relying on it for your design solution. Sometimes there is no such API available providing the information that your product needs, though it is available on the web. This approach of collecting data directly from web pages is called scrapping. It might become handy when you are prototyping your product. However, keep in mind that it will hardly work for a released product and take care of all ethics and legal issues. An HTTP request also includes headers and a body in addition to the URL and the methods. Headers are a set of information that allows the client to specify additional information such as which device it is, how the response should be structured, and credentials for a resource with limited access, for instance. If you read about cookies and personal information that companies collect about the web users, this is where this information transits from client to server. Then we have the HTTP request body, which contains the information to send to the server. Let's take this opportunity to touch on the data structure. To exchange information over the network, we saw the protocol layers that computers need to agree upon. This also involves how this information is structured. There are three common standards, XML, JSON, and CSV. Here, we can see the information necessary to register a new light bulb in the three structures. Perhaps you already encountered CSV files when handling tabular data on a spreadsheet such as MS Excel. Each line represents a row and each comma means the end of a column. It is very efficient and convenient for a vast amount of data, just the data and a comma in between. However, it fails to handle hierarchical information such as a list of light bulbs inside each room. In contrast, XML and JSON are hierarchical structures and embed the information required for computers and humans to interpret the data. Okay, so with the URL, the methods, the header, and the body, we achieve a complete interaction between a client and a server through an HTTP request and response. In this communication model, the client has to, to pull information from the server. Anything happening on the server will not be reflected on the light bulb without actively sending a new HTTP request. There is no standard way for the server to send messages to the clients proactively. For instance, it is inconvenient for a user interface to reflect devices status accurately. Here we can see a connected thermometer on the right pushing temperature updates on the server. The client can use what we call a polling strategy at regular interval in this example, every five minutes, the client sends an HTTP request to get the latest temperature. It means that no temperature change between 8 and 8.05 will be reflected on the client side. This might be enough for a temperature sensor, depending on the product and the application. However, in many situations, a five minute delay would not be acceptable. In this case, we can use a polling frequency by asking the server every minute. 
Now let's look at a connected switch that a user would switch on and off. We want the, the interface to be as reactive as possible, but switch events only happen a few times a day. Polling every second to check the status of the switch would waste a lot of network capabilities and energy. The WebSocket protocol is a way to solve this issue. In this case, the client is sending an initial request to subscribe to the server. Then the server can proactively push messages to all connected clients. This illustrates the subscription pattern in comparison to the polling pattern. Let's wrap up. Above the internet network, we explore the web application relying on the HTTP protocol. Web APIs are what products can expose or rely on from other services on the network. As a designer, it is essential to control what should or should not be disclosed and relied upon through specification and requirements. This includes data structure and communication patterns.